Welcome, everyone, to our Home Service Summit webinar series. Um, could be more excited to have Ryan on here. Uh, obviously, I've known Ryan for a number of years in the industry, and um, I think the first time we met was at an unconference event in Park City, probably like 12 or 13 years ago, back in your uh, Complete Nutrition days. Yep. I think you were fairly new to Five Star, and I was fairly new to Complete. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, as as in back then, you were doing great, and you still are, which is great to watch. Uh, you're your uh, career and how well you've uh, delivered in the franchise industry. So uh, welcome everyone. I just go through the format for those of you, if it's your first time uh, we're live, we've got uh, a bunch of attendees who have the opportunity to ask some questions at the end of this first 45 minutes uh, of Ryan. And uh, so feel free to in the chat on the right hand side here or down below, you see a little bubble. You just hit that, throw into the chat, any questions you've got for either me or Ryan, and we'll make sure at the last 15 minutes, we answer those live for you. Uh, my name is Scott Abbott. I'm the CEO of Pfizer Franchising. I want to make a, a quick plug for our annual event. This will be our third annual Home Service Summit in-person event. It's going to be held in September uh, in, Flo in Florida, Miami, I believe. Uh, you can go. To, you can learn more about it at the homeservicesummit.com website. Uh, there's, I think, some a discount to register if you do it before the end of March or something. But uh, in fact, if you don't mind, Will, if you're still on here in the chat, go ahead and plug the link for those uh, for everyone so they can see that if they want to learn more about it. Uh, I can't wait to get in, into person with you guys. We'll have probably about a thousand attendees uh, that'll be both franchisors in home in the home services industry, as well as some vendors and partners in the industry, as well as some franchisees in the industry. So give me a lot of great content um, and look forward to seeing you all in person. Um, uh, the IFA, I think was a great time for us to get together. Well, let's talk a little bit about that in a minute as well. So I'm sure uh, Ryan, you were there. Yep. I'm assuming. Yep. Yeah. I'm yep. sure there's all kinds of goodies you got from it. So we'll, we'll dig into that in a second. Uh, so quick background, Ryan has 20 years of experience in, in franchising and three private equity exits. Uh, his companies have awarded over 5,000 franchise locations. I'm sure it's probably more than that. And in the last two days, he's probably been involved in 50 more or something. Uh, he, he's been a franchisee 20 times, co-founded Complete Nutrition, a 200 unit franchisor, co-founded Franchise Fastlane, the largest franchise sales company in the U.S. and is now focusing on his latest entrepreneurial and adventure, Franchise Sidekick. Uh, and Franchise Sidekick is a team of franchise advisors whose mission is to help people reduce their risk when buying a franchise. And I can say that I know that uh, as soon as, as Ryan announced his newest venture, uh, we got in, in queue as fast as possible. I know that uh, we've got a few of our brands right now working with, with Sidekick. We're seeing an increase in candidate flow coming through from that partnership. And we're really excited about it. So I, I appreciate your help in helping us grow our business, Ryan. Um, before we get into your backstory and the businesses, how was the IFA for you? Any uh, any big takeaways or, or big things you learned from that event? Yeah, the IFA for me, you know, it's always interesting. I don't know what to expect going in if I'm going to spend a lot of time in general sessions or if I'm going to spend more time in one-on-one -on -one meetings. It usually ends up being more one-on-one -on -one meetings. So it's a reinforcement of relationships, which is any business, right? It's it's always relationships. Uh, but uh, when I when I did get into general session, the thing that I realized is uh, the IFA works hard for us in some political issues that are not on my radar screen every day. So I just feel yeah. grateful and fortunate that we had those folks, Matt Holler and the rest of them, that are working on our behalf because uh, if, if we had to all spend our time on those things, you know, we wouldn't get anything else done. So just a great event. I, I go every year because it's one of my favorites. Yeah. And, and for, for, for franchisees who are in the home service industry or franchisors that are on this call, you know, that the joint employer stuff is always a scary thing. Uh, in fact, I actually, unfortunately had a moment where I had a lawsuit of a, of a, of an employee of a franchisee that sued us and claimed we were, we were their employer, uh -huh. thought they were working for five star. Um, make sure you're, you're insured properly guys. Uh, Rycor, I'll do a shout out for them, helps you you as a system take care of that. But they, uh, and, and so I know they are fighting that battle on our behalf. Uh, and I really appreciate they're doing that because it, uh, it can have an impact on our business clearly. So let's get into your backstory. What got you into franchising, Ryan? Uh, default, like most people, you know, I thought I was going to be on the radio doing, uh, doing sports and I met my wife my senior year of college. So decided to stick around. And my best friend was working at a GNC store. So he, uh, he invited me to come work with him. And I thought I was just going to be there until I got my real job. And uh, it turned out just keeping it just continued to roll into the next and the next and the next. And like all things, I was really fortunate because I ran into some great people, great mentors that continued to, you know, kind of pull me along into the things. So yeah, I got in by uh, default because I didn't want to move away and wanted to uh, see if I was going to marry this girl that I met in college. <laughs> now, were you a franchisee first? Or were you a franchise? Did you start as a franchisor? 
I started as an employee of a franchisee, and then I had some success there. We actually uh, were buying underperforming GNC stores in the Midwest, so I grew yeah. into the COO of that business. Uh, we would buy those, and then I got the bug, right? I mean, when you're sitting there helping somebody run a franchise business, and yeah. we eventually turned that into a supplier. We were a nutritional supplement company for GNC franchisees, so I was traveling the country helping franchisees. and. You know, it's it's a longer story, but basically I was on the road one day and I said, you know, I'm doing this for franchisees. I think I could probably do it for myself. And so uh, actually the, the, I call that my burn the boats moment. That's when I just knew that there was no turning back for me. So I applied with GNC to become a franchisee. You know, fortunately or unfortunately, they denied me too young, not enough money. And uh, I ended up uh, getting approved by Anytime Fitness. So then became a franchisee there. I love it. Yeah, yeah. I, I love uh, for some reason for me being told no is one of the more motivating things. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh, really? Okay. I, I want to prove you wrong kind of thing. And it, it sounds like it's motivated you as well. So that's cool. Yeah. I like to say the best way to, uh, to get somebody to want something really bad is tell them they can't have it. Right. And then, uh, yeah, and that's pretty much it. That's pretty much it. You got it. Yeah. So let's get in, let's dive into, you know, your experience in home service franchising and, uh, you know, your time at, at Fastlane, you guys have, have had a huge impact obviously on our industry. Uh, you know, I, I was at an event recently and someone said to me, you know, Scott, you've been in this business so long. You, you were selling home service franchises when it was even cool and, and it's become cool over the last, you know, five, 10 years. Why do you love selling home service companies? Well, it's the business model. I mean, obviously I love all franchises, but the thing I specifically love about home services and the people on this call have already figured out is it's speed to market. It's typically lower cost than opening something in retail. When you're, if, if you decide that you want to go multi unit, those multi units usually open much quicker. It's not typically dependent on, in a retail concept, one location being profitable and then those profits roll into the next location. A lot of times it's work from home or low cost kind of office or, uh, you know, uh, small office kind of warehouse situation. So when you take the cost, when you take the speed to open, when you take the the need of the services, especially during a time like COVID, which maybe we'll talk more about here, that just created a real explosion for us in home services. Yeah. The business, this business model just makes a lot of sense for people that want to get into entrepreneurship. Yeah. And if for all, all you listening, if you are in the business of selling a home service franchise, uh, home service franchises, uh, Ryan just gave you your first, you know, 30 second pitch. Cause that's it. Right. And that's why I've always loved it. There's no question that, um, it has all those attributes and, and, and it's highly differentiated. I'm curious to see what you've, have you seen a change from the market perspective? I know you love it and I love it. And I think it's a great business and COVID, I think actually highlighted even more the need for our, our business model. Uh, have you seen a change in general from the market's perspective from people getting interested in buying franchises? Is there more interest in general in buying a home service franchise now than you saw, you know, 10 years ago? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think a lot of that is driven because there's more franchisors that are in it now, right? So if you look at it on that side, yeah, this boom is not just on the franchisee side, it's on the franchisor side as well. So you now have more sophisticated portfolio companies that are becoming franchisors, then for, therefore, you know, getting in front of brokers, and then there's more marketing out in the marketplace, and people start to understand the advantages, which then lead to more interested franchisees on top of the things we already talked about, which is the benefit of the business model, the explosion during COVID, uh, typically easier access to capital. So 100%, I don't, I don't know the data, but if I'm just looking at it from my feel and what we see at my companies, then absolutely, there's, there's been an increase in home service franchisees. Well, maybe give us a sense of at Fastlane, and we can talk about Psychic as well if you'd like. What what percentage of the brands you represent or you've been involved in have been a home service brand versus you know health and fitness or beauty or or restaurants? Yeah, um, you know, I'd, I'd be pulling this out of a hat a little bit, but I'd say of of all of our sales of all of Fastlane sales, 60, 70% were, were probably home services. And that really shifted, right? So when Fastlane was first born, it wasn't specifically around any type of franchisor. It was around the next big thing, right? We had a system in place to identify great franchisors, which I believe is, mm -hmm. is something that's really lacking in a lot of franchise development. So we would first go and try to find great franchisors, but then COVID hit. And the beautiful thing about, or what we were very fortunate about in our business model was we were not tied to a specific type of franchise. And so we had to mm -hmm. quickly move away from our brick and mortar, anything that had to do with people in, uh, meeting in person. And we shifted very hard, very fast into home services. And fortunately for us, um, that worked really well. That's what people were looking for as they were getting laid off or as they were at home thinking about their own home project projects, home service franchises exploded as, as COVID started to, uh, to really affect the country. Yeah. So, you know, if you're, if 50, 60% of, your, of the deals you close were home service brands, I mean, you're, you're, that's almost 3000 placements over. And how long has it been? Now, Ryan? Yeah, it's, uh, uh, Fastlane is six years old and they just surpassed 5,000 units uh, in the last few months. So 
Um, it's gone so quick. That's like, you know, 900, 800 units a year you're placing. Well, uh, I, well, in the first, the first few years were pretty lean. So now it's, you know, it's more like 1400 a year. <laughs> oh my gosh. It's incredible. Uh, let's like dig into that a little bit. What, what would you say, you know, when you decided to, well, first of all, what made you decide to start Fastlane? What, you know, you, you've always had a number of exits and at some point you decided, I want to get into this business model. What, tell us the backstory on that. Yeah, well, uh, you know, it actually started at EO. You and I are both uh, involved with EO and an EO uh, member of mine, partner of mine said uh, to me after we had the, the sale of Complete Nutrition and I was thinking about what's next, he said, who do you know? What do you know? And what can you do better? Right. So I've always been fortunate to the next business is one that had kind of piggybacked on the previous one. So at Complete Nutrition, mm -hmm. we had hired an FSO in our last year before the private equity exit. And so I got an, an inside look kind of at, at how it was working. And I started to go to broker conferences and, and understand it. And looking at the business model, it was great. People were having a lot of success, but there was opportunities. And it really started with what I already talked about, which was a process to identify great franchise brands. You know, I, I'm going to quickly get on, on my pedestal and I'm going to come right back. You know, yeah. I think a lot of people talk about how franchising is safer than owning a private business. And I do think, I think in general, franchising is slightly more, 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 uh, less risky than owning your own business. But I don't think it's the way that everybody positions it. The best way to reduce your risk when buying a franchise is to find a franchise, what I call a 5% franchise. So these are the franchises that have what it takes if they're not yet at 100 units to achieve 100 units. And if they're at 100 units to continue to see growth after that. Because when you hit that 100 unit mark, knowing only about 5% of them do it, that's when you start to see national brand awareness. That's when you start to see you know, your corporate support increase. You've got a network of franchisees around you and all the other things that come around that. So if you buy just any old franchise, that's not inherently better than opening a private business. I believe franchising is significantly better when you have somebody that can help you identify those chosen few or that next big thing that are going to become national brands. Tell us, what, what are you looking for? I mean, I, I'm sure, you know, some of us might be so close to this, Ryan, that we just forget, mm -hmm. right? Because we're just in the business, running the business, doing bathrooms or doing blinds, and, and we are trying to get more franchisees. When you, you come outside, you're from the outside of coming in and looking at the business and trying to find the next big best next next big thing, that top five percent. What are you looking for? What are the, the earmarks of someone yeah. that's in that top five percent? Number one is leadership. So a guy like you calls and says, I've been doing this for a number of years and I got the track record. We feel good about it right away, right? Because you've done it. You've got that proven track record. You know what it takes. And fortunately for both uh, Fastlane and Sidekick, we've got lots of great founders that have experienced track records. So that, it begins there. Um, and then we just look at the business model and we say, how is it going to win? How is it going to beat the competitors? What's the unique selling benefit of this? Right. Um, how long have they been doing it uh, for, for an, a brand new emerging franchise or sometimes they're not just ready for, for a franchise development representation. So, you know, a lot of times, especially like at Sidekick, for instance, we want to see for the brands that we truly believe can get to 5 percent. We want to see that they've got at least 25 locations open. They've been doing it for at least five years. We really dig into validation. Right. Um, we partner with companies like FBR to understand validation. We dig into the unique selling proposition, the customer acquisition um, and financials. You know, uh, really, I believe that. Um, at a minimum, what we want to see is a two to one revenue to midpoint of item seven. So for instance, if, you know, let's say the midpoint of the startup cost is $300,000, we want to see average revenues of 600,000. And then we want to see net profits of at least 15% after compensating a manager. If it's 15% before compensating a manager, a lot of times I feel like that, that feels a little bit like buying a job. So there's other things there too, but those are some of the core, uh, core things that we look for. That's uh, there's some gold in there for, for our listeners. I know that some people on this call are, you know, people who just get going, have just gotten going. They have maybe five or 10 or 15 franchises or they're wishing one day that they were a franchisor. Other people here have been doing this for decades, right? I'd love to just you know, get your view on, because I think there's always some exceptions, right, Ryan? I think if we were to go through the, your portfolio of, of uh, brands that you've brought on to Sidekick or onto, onto Fastlane, there have been some brands that have... Uh, that haven't had 25 franchisees, but they had maybe amazing leadership and amazing financials. And that kind of compensated for the fact that they only had 25 franchisees. And so you, you took those brands on for someone who maybe is just getting going and they only have a few years of, of experience. How do they, like, what would you recommend they should do around their leadership? Should they be bringing on advisors? Should they be hiring someone who's got 10 or 15 years experience to help build out their, 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 their management team? How do you, what would you recommend they do? 
Yeah, I'm definitely a believer in advisors, you know, so, and, and it's hard getting an advisor to actually give you time is difficult. I remember when Carmelo Mar uh, Marsala started uh, one of his franchises, he reached out to me and at first I was like, I got no time, but he was pretty persistent, right? And so then he kind of continued to come back and there's been others like that as well. So advisors, yes. Do I recommend that um, they bring in somebody with 10 or 15 years experience onto the staff? I would say that depends. There's one thing that I'm definitely not a believer in, and that is superstar leadership swooping into the business. I, I don't mm -hmm. think that works very often at all. I'm a huge Jim Collins, good to great fan. He talks about it in the book at how that's usually not the winning formula. Usually the winning formula is somebody from within the organization that understands their core values, how they do things that helps the company propel. So I'd go that direction. Uh, but, you know, I often talk to uh, emerging franchisors and they're they're worried. They're worried because they've got some unique selling benefit and they say, if I don't go fast, the big guys are going to get a hold of this and then I'm going to be second to market. And I think that's the wrong motivation. Being second to market, there's nothing wrong with it. It's being the best at whatever that unique selling benefit is. And so I am a huge believer in two things, momentum and patience. So mm -hmm. constantly look at the business and make sure you're getting better. You're creating momentum. But take the very long term vision at your franchise model. If you're in it because you see other people that have sold 200 units and sell in five years and you're in it for the wrong reason. Those are the exceptions, not the rules. Yeah. yeah. I'd love to dig in a little bit to uh, something that I've experienced uh, for, for our listeners. We actually use Fastlane for two of our brands uh, of our six. Uh, they've helped us with Mosquito Shield, which we acquired and was our, had an existing relationship. And then we established a relationship with Fastlane on our Bath Solutions brand. And uh, I can say that one of the things I noted that, th that I was really impressed with, I'd like you to speak to, is Carrie. And she was phenomenal. First of all, she's phenomenal. She's mm -hmm. an amazing business operator, yes. right? But she got really dug in really deep on the item 19, on the financials piece. And she just like tore it apart, dissected it, and made sure that it gave the right information to the buyers. And when you've got a killer big company, which we have at Bath Solutions, it's like, it's just gold, right? And she's so good at just pulling that gold out of the mine and just making sure that everyone can see it. How, how do you, would you say there's a process there that you could speak to that our listeners should be aware of around their item 18? Like what are the most important things that they've got to make sure that they're talking about in their, in their item 18 and their, in their FDD? It is 100% a learned process and it's difficult. It was learned over time. And, and there's, there's two major mistakes, I believe in, in item 19 creation. Um, one is, uh, listening to somebody who tells you you don't need it. Now, I understand, uh, you know, you're going to talk to an, an attorney who's going to tell you there could be some liability involved with that. But remember, of all the franchisors, I think something like 75 or 80% of franchisors now have an item 19. So when you really yeah. think about what that liability is, there shouldn't be liability as long as you've got a strong understanding of your numbers. They're accurate. They tell the right story and you put them in there. Um, and then the second mistake is, I don't know the, I don't know a better term to use. So I'm just going to say it this way. People puke all their information in there and it doesn't yeah. tell you anything. Too much information yeah. is a bad thing because people mm -hmm. get into analysis paralysis and they don't know what to do with the information. And so uh, your comment about carry and fast lane and others is that uh, it's storytelling. Your item 19 mm -hmm. should tell a story, right? And so first off, if you're a franchisor, if you don't have very clear information, that should be a priority of yours. Separate your corporate uh, entity from any corporate, lo you know, corporate locations that act kind of like a franchise business would. Make sure you're getting the information from franchisees on a regular basis, basis make it a requirement. There's plenty of vendors out there to help you do that. Then once yeah. you have that information, how do you lay it into an item 19? You know, first off, can you show what uh, franchisees under a year look like? What does what the ramp up? You know, what does the first three to six months look like? How about over a year? How about mature locations that are three years or more? How about those that have full-time franchisees as operators? How about those that have uh, semi-absentee operators? How about those that are following the marketing system versus those that don't, right? Tell a story about, hey, these are the systems we've created. These are the things we believe in. And if mm -hmm. you follow them, here's how those stores perform versus the rest. Then when somebody gets inside of your system, you should have key performance indicators that are just an extension of that item 19. Here's what we told you as you were coming in. This is what you built your business model off of. And look, these are the five most important KPIs to us, even inside of our business today. So mm -hmm. they're prepared. They have their, it's like starting running into the franchise system because they know exactly what to measure in their business. If, for those of you listening, um, I hope you noted that as Ryan went through that, he was literally, he knows who the buyer is and the profile of those buyers and he's building his item 19 and his FDD for those buyers, right? So you have different kinds of avatars coming in that are buying your business. As he went through those, making sure that he's answering the questions for those individuals from a buyer's perspective. And, and once again, I just want to remind, like it's, it's tough sometimes. We're in the business. We're in the middle of the forest. Sometimes we don't see it. But uh, simplifying information, making sure the most important facts are, are present, 
not, pu- as you said, puking all over the page with just endless data, but making sure it's very succinct and, and targeted to the audience that you're writing it for, right? You're going to have someone who wants to be an absentee owner. Maybe your brand doesn't, doesn't fit for them. So there's no need to talk about absentee owner because you don't take those, right? But if you do, and that is the dream for a lot of buyers who come through brokers, they want to find an additional business, another revenue source, making sure you're speaking to that audience. And I, and I do love what you mentioned there, Ryan, which is follow, the follow-up, right? If you're going to give all this information in the, in the admin team, making sure you're following up in the business that, that's always being gathered and you, so they can see how they're doing against what they thought they're going to do. Uh, that, that's, I think, super valuable. Um, let, let's dive into franchise sales piece of this business. You know, Fastlane has to attract top talent to be able to sell these concepts. And uh, how, first of all, how do you find them? Uh, how important is compensation versus culture when you're attracting those people? I, I know the guys and the women at, at, at uh, Fastlane work really hard. Uh, I actually just recently, I don't even know this or not, I actually bought uh, two LA Mental Health franchises oh. myself. I'm a franchisee. For the first time in my life, I, I own something <laughs> other than my own concepts. That's great. I've had you. franchises of my own concept, but I actually went and bought uh, two locations from LA Mental Health. And went through that process and, you know, really just learned actually for the first time ever being on the other side of the, you know, what that looks like. How, how do you, how do you find top talent? How do you keep them? How important is culture? Uh, you know, maybe speak to that for that for us a little while. Yeah, hundred percent. Well, I, I wish I could tell you that I had a, a fantastic recruiting process, but the reality of it is that uh, a reputation is something that follows you forever, right? And so fortunately, mm-hmm. um, at Fastlane, when we started it, our first several employees were people that I had previously worked with, people that I had previously known. I tapped them on the shoulder and said, you know, here is our vision. So you have to have a, a clear and compelling vision. What did we want to do? And, you know, you asked me the question earlier, and I don't think I really answered it. There was three things that we felt we could do different at Fastlane. One was identify next big thing franchise brands. Two was uh, build it on top of technology that really made the job um, easier is the wrong word, but more efficient. It helped us create a reputation for franchisors that they couldn't create on their own. And three, which was really not being done at the time, is we created a company that allowed everybody to focus on being great at one thing. I am a huge believer in be great at one thing and outsource the rest, right? Be be a rifle, not a shotgun. Hit one target really, really hard. So when we started Fastlane, we said that we wanted, you know, people to be specifically focused on driving leads, others on qualifying and, and, uh, you know, calendaring leads. And then our directors that were going to be building the relationship and educating leads. And then lastly, the vice presidents who were going to come in and make sure that everything was buttoned up and kind of closing the deal, if you will. So over Mm -hmm. time, and we have a tremendous number of at-bats. So over time, they get very, very, very good at their specific thing. So, you know, when we could go to the the people that we had previously worked with and said, we believe these three things are going to help propel us into one of the leaders in the category. Here's how it's going to impact you. Here's how we think you're going to grow with the organization, because that's really what people want. I mean, even at the IFA, um, they were talking a lot about one of the things that's most important to people outside of compensation is understanding their future inside of the organization, how they're going to grow. And so we wanted to lay out what that looked like. What's it look like to go from somebody in support to a director, from a director into a VP and beyond? So, it, you know, it's it wasn't anything that I could just say applies across the board. It was leveraging reputation. It was laying out a clear and compelling vision and then just taking a lot of at-bats. There was plenty of people that said no to us as well. Yeah. Uh, maybe I, I want to point out something as well here, because I think one of the things that every franchisor is doing when they're building their own internal team, right? And we're trying to, we're always trying to tra- attract the best people in their positions. And I, and I've had experience with this where, you know, I, I've, I've hired a killer franchise sales ex- uh, executive historically has moved a ton of units. And then, and this is earlier in my career. And then they came into my organization and they don't thrive in the same way that they did in their prior experience. And Sometimes I think it's easy to make the assumption that an amazing franchise salesperson will just come in and transform your franchise sales process and they will just close a ton of deals. And we, and we discount how important the tools are to that. And as you mentioned, the business process that feeds that. So you could have somebody who's really good, but has an amazing process and has killer sharp tools, like an amazing item 19, the right FDDs, a great concept, has all of that. And you marry those together and that's when it gets really explosive, right? And so I just want to remind our listeners that uh, spending the time, as, as Ryan mentioned here, spending the time on the process, having the aces in their places and knowing exactly who needs to do what in that, in that process so that the person at the end of, the, of this entire experience can actually close deals. It's because of the entire team working together harmoniously 
and focusing on what they can do, you know, better than anyone else. And so, uh, and, and if, if you have someone you've hired and, then, and they're only doing one third of what they did in their last job, you should probably look at yourself and see what, you're, what, what should be done differently. So that's a reminder, I think, for us all to, to be better in that process. Um, now, we want to transition here to Psychic in a minute. Before we do, obviously, you, you know, I think it was last year, you closed a, a transaction, sold Fastlane before you move on to your, your, next, uh, your next business. Uh, tell me about that. Like, what, how'd that happen? It's the first time. I don't know of any FSO that's ever sold. Has, has it ever happened? Uh, you know, I think uh, St. Gregory was purchased by Exponential. So there's been one before, I believe. Yep. Okay. It has yeah. happened before. Okay, great. Yeah. So yeah. talk to us about, you know, how, why did private equity want to get in, involved in, in the business of selling franchises versus owning them? Because everyone loves recurring revenue. You got to go out in there and eat, you know, you got to hunt, hunt it down and kill every day. And it's uh, every day is a new day. You're only yeah. good as your last quarter, right? <laughs> so, Absolutely. That's a, a great question. And honestly, leading up to that point, I didn't know what the market for an FSO was going to be, nor was I even exploring it. And, you know, back to the previous comment about uh, St. Gregory selling, they were also a franchisor. So I think they were sort of a, a tag along with the franchise brand that was sold. So, uh, well, first off, uh, there was no plans to sell Fastlane. I mean, I love that business. That was, that was something that I was super passionate about because it did a couple of things for me. Most importantly, it helped me, it helped me help people become entrepreneurs. I mean, that is my vision in life, my mission in life. I should say, I want to help more people become a franchisee than anybody in history. So I got a long runway ahead of me. Right. And so that was mm -hmm. hit right there in the middle of the sweet spot. Um, it was profitable. You know, uh, like you had mentioned earlier, Carrie is a fantastic leader. She was running the day to day. I had no pain, uh, but it was an interesting story because we had a lot of the franchise brands we were representing selling to private equity, you know, mm -hmm. and so I, I met Patrick Gallagher from Boxwood, who is a, an investment banker who helps franchise or sell. And uh, we just got to talking and I said, I want to better understand what is happening in these franchise brands that are allowing them to sell for the multiples that they are because they were phenomenal multiples. And so we got to talking about that and he's a good investment banker. So like all of them, he said, well, Hey, would you mind if I just took a peek at the, uh, you know, kind of under the covers of fast lane? So I said, sure, why not? So, uh, you know, he took a, he took a look at it and came back and said, you know, if you decided you ever wanted to go to market, here's what I think it might look like. And it was surprising to me. I didn't expect it to, um, to have the, 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 the market interest that it did, but I had an allergic reaction. Really? I said, no, I can't. I said, I love this business. Uh, I, I'm not ready to be done. You know, I'm uh, four, I think I was 41 at the time. And I said, I'm, I don't have a lot of hobbies. I want to keep helping people buy franchises. I, and, but after some time of thinking about it and processing it, looking at the opportunity, it was one of those like, you know, is this something that you pass up in your lifetime? Is this once in a lifetime opportunity for your family and, you know, yep. things like that? So I went back to them and I said, look, there's only one way I would do it. I said, we've got this little division inside of Fastlane that was driving organic leads called My Fastlane Track, had two employees. Mm -hmm. I said, if I could buy My Fastlane Track out of Fastlane and continue to help on the client side, then mm -hmm. I would be open to the idea of, you know, private equity into Fastlane. And so after some, some time and thought and conversations about it, a lot of conversations and thought about it, um, it was decided that that could happen. So in May of last year, Fastlane, uh, Southfield Capital made in, the investment into Fastlane. And then I moved over um, to the Sidekick side. And at the time, it wasn't called Sidekick. Uh, if you don't mind, I just want to tell one more quick story. And then yeah, uh, I, was, I was reading a book by Donald Miller. Me and uh, my co-founder, Tyler, were reading a book by Donald Miller that's called Building a Story Brand. And if you haven't read it, I highly encourage it because it's a business book that talks about your customer and their journey. And it says too many companies position themselves as the hero, but we're not the hero. Our customers, our clients are the hero. Our clients are looking for a guide, a trusted guide who's got a proven process to get to a desired outcome. So as we're talking about the book, we both sort of look at each other and we say, well, who's got the back of a hero? A sidekick, right? And so franchise, sidekick, that's right. Robin to Batman, right? Dr. Brown to Marty McFly. Um, and so we said franchise sidekick it is because the goal is to help people reduce their risk when buying a franchise. So that's how sidekick was born. That is, uh, I love that. I love that. And, and it continues to follow your why, which it, as you've expressed a number of times on this call, and I just want to just hit on this because I think um, it's really hard, you know, when I've built businesses and I, and, and who a leader is, whether you like it or not, their value system kind of goes throughout the organization. Right. And, and what I started to realize is that it's really, when, when you really have a good North star and you know exactly who you stand for and who you are, it's almost impossible to, to take that away from any business you're building, the culture you're building. And so I think for leaders of any business, knowing what makes you tick, like what, what do you, what gets you up every morning, gets you excited should be one of the very first things you get to understand. And that self-awareness and coming to that, to, to grips with who, you know, what's important to you unlocks all kinds of value because as you've just shown here, Ryan, 
you can take your passion for entrepreneurship and helping people become entrepreneurs to so many different businesses, like complete nutrition, right? Fast lane, sidekick. You're still doing exactly what you love doing. It's under a different, slightly different flavor, but it's still Ryan doing what he loves to do in those different businesses. And so I think, uh, just remember, remind, remind, a reminder to everyone on this call that, uh, you know, knowing what your why is, why do you, what gets you out of bed every morning? What gets you excited? How do you, how do you build a business that you can't wait to go to every single day of the week? Uh, and then life is, is so much more enjoyable when that happens. So that's a great reminder for us all to keep that front and center. And Scott, can I say one thing on that too? I think yeah. for a long time, I had it backwards. Um, you know, uh, people were always telling me, do what you love. And we hear a lot of people say, do what you love. And sometimes that's hard. You know, if I love golfing or if I love whatever, it's hard to go figure out a way to make money doing it sometimes. What happened to me and what I'm a believer in now is fall in love with what you do. Um, and so I fell into franchising. I fell into nutrition. I fell into the whole idea and it just continued to roll into one thing after the next. But then after the sale of complete nutrition, falling in love with the idea of something that I was already doing. See, I thought I was a nutrition guy. I wasn't. I was helping people. I was a guy that was helping people become entrepreneurs. That's what got me fired up. And when my EO uh, member helped me realize that is what I loved, I fell in love yeah. with something I was already doing. So, you know, it, it's hard. It, it took me quite, uh, you know, I had a number of years in my career before I really realized it. But once I realized what that North Star was, you can't take it away. Yeah, that is, uh, you know, it's probably even worth noting, right? Because there's, there's a lot of people who, have what I call passions. You can love something and you can be really passionate about something. I think there's, there's a little slight difference here in these different, different things. And I've seen some people, like you mentioned, you know, they're so passionate about golf that they almost ruin it because they take their passion, they turn it into a job or they're so passionate about any kind of activity that they love doing. But I actually look at that and go, is it golf you really are passionate about? Or do you love competing and doing something in an exactness that allows for a result and a win, like, is it that, is it that process you fall in love with or is it the game of golf? And, and so, uh, you know, I, I definitely would not advise people to go quit their day jobs and do what they love or what they're passionate every single day, but to fall in love, what you said, like you mentioned in the things that they're doing. And once again, I, it is being reflective of what are you, what's your why? It's the Simon Sinek book. Read it. Ask yourself that question. It took me years it took me years to understand exactly what makes Scott Abbott tick, and I'm 48. So uh, don't don't rush it either. Well, you, well um, you, you fooled us all well because it looked like you knew what you were doing from the beginning. So uh, <laughs> yeah, it's a journey, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, let's talk about Sidekick now a little bit. I'm really glad you share with us. You know what got you into the business. You know why you decided to start Sidekick. Now, can I dissect for us exactly what Sidekick does? Like, what is Sidekick? What is the business? What's the model? And how do you help franchisors? Yeah, great question. Thanks for asking. So uh, most people on this call are probably familiar with the various broker groups out there. They're, they've been around for you know 30 plus years. They do a fantastic job. Um, I, I've worked with many of those people and they are phenomenal at what they do. Um, and so really, like we had already talked about, I am very passionate about helping people buy a business. Fastlane was you know, going to have the investment from Southfield. So I had to think about how was I going to continue to do that? Sidekick was born. And so I got an opportunity to look at it and say, what's the Ryan way? I don't want to say the better way necessarily, but just what's the Ryan way? And the most important thing to me was I wanted us to feel like a team every single day, right? Um, I think it was even said at the IFA recently, like oh, Drew Brees said it when he was on stage. He said the teams that perform best are the ones that love each other the most, right? Mm -hmm. And it's, it's hard sometimes if you're in an organization where you're a 1099 and you're on your own doing most of the things on your own to really fall in love with the people, the process and make it better for the clients. And so that was the, the core thing that we were going to base this on, which was we are all team members, employees of Franchise Sidekick. So the traditional model of, you know, uh, broker groups are going to be that it's a, a company that's uh, that sits at the top, if you will. It's usually pretty lean um, and they're going to provide a, a portfolio of brands. They're going to provide conferences, opportunity to network, which is great. And then uh, the individual consultants are 1099s responsible for running their business day to day, similar to a franchise, if you will. Well, actually a little different than a franchise, but, you know, people out there running their own business day to day. And I thought, well, what if the organization took on the risk? What if we took on the risk of the, the payroll? What if we took on the risk of the lead gen, building out the technology, which brands we were going to work with and how we were going to talk about them? And what was the power of collaborating and meeting every single day? And how was that going to get translated to the client? And that's what we do. We meet every day. We did it this morning. We talk about yesterday's uh, activities. We talk about franchise brands. We talk about what clients think. We're building technology that is going to be extremely robust to help somebody understand that entire journey and prepare them to become a franchisee uh, that'll roll out here in about 60 days. And I can't tell you how powerful it is 
or even that whole idea that Drew Brees said, how we all really enjoy each other, working with each other every day, lifting each other up, holding each other accountable. And that then translates to the client, which the purpose for the client is to help them reduce their risk when buying a franchise. Right. So mm -hmm. there's three things that we offer. One is what we call kind of inside information. And that is first derived by the fact that we're all talking about it every single day. What's working. Right. Number two is I already talked about it. The five percent brands. Right. Helping somebody identify those brands we believe are going to be a five percent or they're either going to achieve 100 units or if they're already there, they're going to continue to grow. That's where the real risk reduction is created for somebody. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and lastly is what we call the sidekick seven. These are seven steps that I created after, you know, awarded many franchises that, that, that does a couple of things. One, it walks somebody through the process to be sure they have all the information they need to make an informed decision. And two, it gives them access to experts to be sure that they're set up and ready for success. So those are the three things. We got a few other things that are coming down the pipeline. They're not quite ready. The company's only 11 months old, but we really do believe there's a few other things that are going to change it for people when considering a franchise. Uh, you mentioned a few things I want to dig into, um, and, and I'll just make a note here. We got ten minutes left before we let uh, any of our attendees or listeners ask questions. So feel free, guys, if you've got questions that are, are burning, go ahead and throw those into the chat. I'll make sure we get to them in about uh, ten minutes. Uh, what you said, the Sidekick Seven, I love it. I think that every company should be branding all the time, everything in their business in some way that helps everyone understand exactly what it is they're doing. You know, so I'm sure in your organization, when you hear say that word, everyone knows exactly what that means. What is the sidekick seven? I want to hear it. Yeah. Okay. So first it's going to be um, the qualification, right? So somebody comes in and we qualify them and then it's going to be an introduction. Then it's going to be a franchise fit. We give them a survey. A lot, a lot of people do. We have six parts of the fit uh, because when somebody's thinking about a franchise, we believe it comes down to time, money, business preferences, probability of success, community involvement and growth, right? So we've got a process that we take, or growth opportunity. So we've got a process that we take them to understand all six of those categories. Then we get into a match. We, uh, we introduce them to the franchisors. We then get into what we call the momentum process. This is when we ensure that uh, we're getting the information that we need. We, we uh, coach them through validation. We get the legal uh, review done and we get the financing set up. And then it's going to be the confirmation day attendee and, uh, and then what we call ribbon cutting. So. I think I got all seven in there. Yeah, I, I'm madly writing notes down here because everything you you you, you provide is gold, and I, I'm sure that um, our listeners can agree with that. The other thing I want to touch on that you mentioned, I think, is really important. You said that um, the teams that perform well or excellently love each other the most. And over the last several years, I've you know I've come to this realization that the way I describe the people in my company is we're a high performing sports team. Everyone has their position. Everyone has to perform those positions, but we're not a family. Families are together. You know, you can't leave your family. Mm -hmm. it, you can leave a sports team if you're not performing. And, but you've inj injected a word inside there that I think it's important to just maybe unpack a little bit. The, that the, the teams that perform the best are the ones that love each other the most. And love is usually associated with family, which is why I think a lot of people say, and I hear it happen often in business, you know, we're, we're a happy family here. Our, our brand's a great family or the franchisees and us are a family. Families have a lot of dysfunction. So I try to, I tend to try to avoid that word. Why? Maybe I just, what do you mean by love the most? When you say the teams that perform the best, love each other the most. What does that mean to love each other the most? Yeah, great question. And by the way, it's a fairly new concept to me as well. You know, this was something that Drew Brees said at the IFA that I really grasped onto. Prior to that, I would have told you the ones that lift each other up, that have each other's back, that support each other. And, and I do think that falls into the definition of love each other the most. You know, we are a remote, remote organization. Most of our time is spent on Zoom collaborating. So how do you really start to care about your coworkers? And I think, again, this is this is just my beliefs and it works for me, is it's a clear and compelling vision. When you do something that you feel like you can make money and support your family while also feeling really good at the end of your life. Like you want to go to Christmas and tell your family, Hey, guess what? I just helped 50 people become entrepreneurs, you know, last yeah. year. That is something mm -hmm. that you can be very proud of. And when you have a group of people helping you do something that not only supports your family, but allows you to feel real purpose in your life. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, maybe it's love. Maybe it's something close, but it's just people that really care about each other. Yeah. I, I love how you described that. And I want to remind in just the, you know, everyone should know what the business's core purpose is. And there's no question when pe when people know what the purpose of the organization is, and it's a, and it's a meaningful purpose, uh, you get a lot of motivation and excitement, and and, and it's the business becomes very very sticky. People want to be in something like that's got that uh, that vibe. So I love that you you shared that with us. Um, so let's dive into some parts of you know Sidekick. What's working around? I want to talk about two things. One, you mentioned about some processes, some technology, AI. You know, a lot of people 
were at the IFA. They heard about it. They've, you can't avoid it. It's everywhere. People are writing all their articles and their talks and their presentations. There's probably people writing books right now using Chat GPT, right? Like, yep. like they're the author and the computer did the entire thing. They just made the title or something. Yeah. So I'd love to hear maybe two things. One, <laughs> excuse me. Are you leveraging AI yet? Do you expect to leverage AI? If so, how in Sidekick? And then second is where do you where do you see lead gen coming from? For psychic, where are you finding your candidates? Yeah, great question. So the first question on AI is yes, we are just beginning to leverage it. And it, you know, I'm I'm fortunate that I've got a team full of people that are really uh, they have a deep understanding of that. I personally don't, so thank goodness I surround myself with people that are smarter than I am. Um, but the way that we're first going to leverage it is, um, I love making videos. I could easily get in front of a camera and talk about franchising. We're doing it right now. Where I struggle is if I've got to put all of that down on paper and try to make it something that somebody would actually be willing to read. So. Um, how we're using a process right now is I will create content. In fact, I just did one recently on uh, how to review an FDD in under 10 minutes, right? Not a, not a super exciting, but important to our clients as they're going through the process, right? Mm -hmm. Well, now we're leveraging AI to take that video, turn it into content that will then go out into different areas, you know, uh, different franchise publications that will become sort of a lead magnet, if you will, that will drive them back into us and, and we can explain it even more. So that's really how we're leveraging it today. We are a content company. Again, we're only 11 months old, but we've got lots of content already created, much more that's going to be coming. And this will be our first test into AI. I'm a crawl, walk, run guy. So we're going to crawl into it. We're going to test it. We're going to see if it's genuine yeah. and authentic. And if it feels genuine, authentic, and it truly helps people reduce their risk, we'll continue to push into it. Um, the next part of your question on leads, you know, franchise leads are, are so funny. I was, I was spoiled for a long time at Fastlane because when, uh, when you go into the broker groups, it takes a while to build a reputation. Yeah. But once you build a reputation, you know, you forget sometimes, um, or, you know, how, how hard it is for a consultant or a broker to go out and create a really good lead. They got to spend a lot of time and a lot of money. And then they trusted those folks to be sent over the fence to Fastlane. And so that's something that they take very seriously. And now I'm on the opposite side. Now I got to go spend, right? Because nobody knew who Sidekick was 10 months ago. So now we got to go spend to create that. And, you know, it, I, I don't know how, how replicable what we are doing is for everybody, but I'll just, I'll still explain it. Um, we go out there and we do a lot of digital marketing. We do a lot of content creation. We do SEO, we test broker portals and other things, but the most important part isn't where we're spending. It's how are we measuring it? And then how are we having a regular cadence to be sure when we do get good leads, they're working through, through the, through the process, the proper way. Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's no lack of opportunity to go wherever you want and finding leads, but the key is understanding your methodology of how long, what, how are you going to create a clear and compelling message? How long are you going to let it run? What's your budget? How are you going to measure it? And do you have the ability to just shut it off if it's not working and continue to push into it when it is? So that's going to be different for everybody based on the avatar. You already talked about that. I mean, where we go get our portfolio Pete's is a heck of, heck of a lot different than where we get our side business Sam's. And so it's something that we yeah. spend a lot of time on. Side business Sam. It's, I'm writing that one down. Oh my <laughs> gosh. Uh, you know what? I, uh, you just said something probably even accidentally. I don't know if you did, if anyone notices this, but, uh, Ryan described how he did a 10 minute video on analyzing an FDD and you, you talked about content and how to get leads, you need to drive content. I think a lot of time people think content's just like, once you, like, it's like, like you said earlier, puking all over a page, just writing some content, getting an AI to write articles for you. So you can just fill pages. But Ryan talked about being very specific. He knows what people need to learn if they want to get into franchising. He's delivering content that is valuable. Very, very highly, highly valuable for that person, side, side business or side business Sam, which I just wrote down. And, and in delivering that kind of content, stuff that's super valuable, he's me attracting people to sidekick because he's me delivering value to the people who want to get into franchising. So if you're thinking about your business, you're thinking about, I need to drive content. The first question you have to ask, which I think comes back to the book you read earlier. You know, if you want to be a hero, if you want to, if you want to make someone the hero in a story, what do you give them to make sure they can make good decisions and think it from that, their lens? How do you give them everything they need to know and add value to their life? If you do that, you're going to find people to be attracted to, uh, you know, the, the business you're, you're, you're driving. So I've got some questions loading up. Go ahead. Go ahead. Ryan. I just want to add one thing there because that that's so right on. And then those of you that understand your, your sales funnel really well, you can take it even a step further. So why did we write content on how to review an FDD in 10 minutes? Because we saw a lot of our clients were uh, falling out of the process at that point. So when we see a spike in people falling out of the process, we recognize this is, this is a hurdle. This is a pain point that they don't understand. So then we can generate content and deliver it to them at that point to help them get past that. Oh, I, 
this stuff is golden. It's a reminder to me. I'm so glad we're having this call. It's a reminder to me how I need to be better at listening to who my, who my customer is and what are their needs and delivering value to them in the process. And if you keep asking yourself that question, how do I do, how do I deliver more value to them? You're just going to find that it, it works. More people come to you because you're giving what they want. Um, We've got some questions loading up here. Before we get to those questions, I got some more questions. What software are you using currently to manage all the leads coming in? As you mentioned, you know, to make good decisions and to feed what works and start what doesn't, you got to make sure you know what's actually working, what's not working, right? What are you using to track all that for yourself? Yeah, our our, uh, our marketing and sales software is HubSpot. Uh, and we did that because we're a marketing company first, right? And so HubSpot is one of the better CRM platforms at managing the marketing. Um, oh, Scott, did I lose you? I, look, I think I'm frozen yep. here. I'm here. You're here. I can still see you. Are you there? Yep. Oh, okay. Sorry. I don't know where I lost you. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, but I was saying um, our sales and marketing software is HubSpot. Yeah, we chose that one because they're really well known on the front end, the marketing, the leads, communicating with the leads. Um, our project management software we use is monday.com. We got lots of projects going on at any one time. So we got a methodology that we use. And then we're building the Sidekick Command Center. I've got two software developers on, on staff and they spend 100% of their time developing the Sidekick Command Center, which is going to have three portals. It's going to have an internal portal. It's going to have a franchisor portal and it's going to have a client portal. And so we try to get all those, all those different pieces of technology talking to ultimately make it a better client experience. Note again, everyone, Sidekick Command Center. Ryan is fantastic at this. He's branding everything in a way that people know what's it all about. So uh, this, we can learn so much from this call. Thank you so much. So, so I've got questions coming in. I want to get to those. I may have a few others I'll drop in later on because I, I, I have questions for you as well. But sure. uh, Paul's got a question here. Thanks for joining us, Paul. How many pages should an FDD be? And when do you know it's too long? It's no number. I, I, you could never pick a number of pages, right? It's too long when you start adding things in there that are allowing the legal tail to wag the dog, if you will, right? And so just, I can't tell you how many times, I mean, at Fastlane, we would look at 200 plus brands a year. And so many times we'd get into the FDD and we'd start asking questions. And the founder, when we would ask the questions to the founder or the de development person, the answer would be, I don't know why we have that in there. The lawyer told us to put it in, which I understand, yeah. right? We all, we all talk to lawyers and we want to listen to the lawyers because they're the experts and we're paying them to be the experts. But apply common sense, right? Look at the, look at the document and say, would you sign it? If you weren't the franchisor and you were a franchisee considering a business opportunity, would you sign it? Would you feel comfortable in that relationship? So just look at whatever's essential for your business. Make sure that it's not overly burdensome on a franchisee and then apply a little common sense. And I bet you'll have the right number of pages. You know, what you could do is you could just change the font size. If you want to go to little, <laughs> go to little mouse yeah. nut style font, right? It's just like down to like three, Anyway, <laughs> okay, Cliff, we got a question. Uh, when you respect each other, you care how they show up and will help elevate each other. That's a team. Good comment. I agree with you, Cliff. Thank you for sharing that. Sure. Mark, uh, he's got a question. Item 19, realize the importance of it and a necessity. Being a Canadian brand with history and, and units up here, moving into the US, we've been told that we just can't have an item 18 as it's a separate entity. We have struggled to create an item 18, but it's close to impossible to use numbers does an item 19 have to, does an item 19 have any other way to tell the story? We are in the home services sector. So question is, if we don't have an item 19, are we dead in the water? Well, you're not dead in the water. There's obviously ways, uh, or not, I should say, obviously that's the wrong word. There's other ways that you can help clients or candidates understand what's going on in your franchise. And a lot of times that's invalidation. Let them talk to your existing franchisees. I do want to challenge the idea that you can't have an item 19. I'm not an attorney. This is not legal advice. Go ask your own. But we have had plenty of Canadian brands that have used Canadian numbers in an item 19. Then you have to have clear footnotes that explain it's in Canadian mm -hmm. currency, not in US currency. However, when you dig in, have the KPIs um, show the number of customers that you're serving because a customer is a customer, right? And, and you have an idea of what you're going to be able to price it in the U S versus in Canada. And so I would be really clear in your KPIs about the number of customers you're serving, be clear in the fact that that's Canadian currency. And if you can try to go and pioneer a U.S. location with somebody, um, many of the Canadian brands that we've helped develop, uh, Everline, SprayNet, um, I feel like I'm missing another one, but uh, they pioneered a location in the U.S. that they could use for validation first. Great point. And Mark, I'm, I'm Canadian. I've brought a number of brands from Canada and the United, United States. Um, we, I can't think of us not having a 19 when we made that transition. 
I think it's in the disclosures. Once again, as Ryan said, I'm not a lawyer. This isn't legal advice. Talk to your, your attorney. But I, I don't think it stopped us from having, having an item 19. We just increased the disclosure around some of the information. So uh, that hopefully it's helpful. Matt's got another question here for us. Let's see. How many emails do you use in your drip campaign? And how often are you sending emails in the first 30 days? I need my co-founder on here to give you the exact answers. I will tell you, we have th thousands of automations in the process and it, it's all a journey, right? It depends on what's going on with the client. If, the, if they sit there and hold for seven days and they're not active, they're going to get a different email than if they are active, right? Um, in, the, in the first 30 days, again, the number of emails are going to depend on if they're engaged with us and in the process or if it's somebody that we've had a challenge reaching out to. Um, forgive me, this is probably going to be a little bit wrong, but if I just had to put a number on it, I would tell you several a week on top of our, um, what we call specialist or other people would call call qualifiers, reaching out to them regularly. Uh, here, here's a little tip, uh, you know, a little uh, secret sauce, if you will, that I learned from somebody online is call, a, uh, call somebody who inquired with you twice, two times in a row. If I see a number that I don't recognize, and, and if you can, there's ways to go uh, make it a local number. But if I see a number that I don't recognize, I typically am not going to answer it. If they call back again, I'm, I'm thinking they really need to get a hold of me. So your call conversion goes up quite a bit if you call two times in a row. And I think, and to add on to that, I'm sure texting is part of your automation uh, when you're, you know, reaching up to people. You, you, you noted here that uh, Ryan said a thousand, you know, a thousand automations. That's a lot. I don't know how many we have. I can tell you that uh, at Pronexus, our our call center and and uh, customer experience solution, there is so much automation and there's so much an, a science behind everything we're doing around every single phone call. I'll give you another tip. For example, if you're going to call somebody, don't call them on the hour. If you call someone at 11 o'clock, that's when almost all meetings start. You call them at 1055. So we literally create automations around texts and calls to happen at the highest probability of answer. And we are tracking through thousands and thousands and thousands of phone calls a day that are coming in and thousands and thousands of phone calls we're making on the outbound. Uh, that's, I mean, he's probably going to call back again a second time. I apologize. <laughs> you know, there's going to be a science behind that. You analyze it and you do what you do, you know, as an example, we may, we may call someone at the exact same time that they requested a, 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 a information. So if they request an information at Tuesday at 10, 15, that probably means that they're available on Tuesdays around 10, 15. So while we do our follow-up calls twice the same day, there's one at 15, one at an hour, one at four hours. Then we're calling the next day at 10, 15, because they call the prior day at 10, 15. Then we're calling at 10, 55 before the end of the hour. So you're doing all these things to ultimately get the highest response rate. And when you're talking about large volumes of numbers, uh, you know, a, a one, two, three percent increase in conversion rate can have a massive impact on the bottom line, especially in digital lead gen. So hopefully that's helpful to you, Matt. Um, well, we'll Scott, come to, I just want to yeah. say real quick, that was helpful to me. So thank you. I wrote down a couple of notes there. And if I could just say one thing real quick, because I think it's so important for franchisors. Hopefully you found some of what I'm saying today to be useful. Obviously, what, what you've been saying, Scott, has been very useful. And it's because we are experts, if you will, at our specific thing. And I'm a believer that franchisors should go be experts at their business, whatever that is, dry cleaning, food, fitness, you name it, go be the best in the world at that. And then do your best to outsource everything else, right? You mentioned Rycor earlier. As a franchisor, I would never, ever consider becoming an insurance company. Why? Because I could never be great at it. I couldn't figure out underwriting and rates and everything else. So you outsource insurance, you outsource accounting, and you outsource call centers, you outsource franchise development. So I would encourage people to Think of their their core competency more of managing partners um, outside of whatever their core business is. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with that. There was a time when I when I first started, younger entrepreneur, I thought I'd built everything, uh, which is why I built Pronexus. I can tell you, it's uh, you know, if if Pronexus had existed, I would I would buy it today. Just use the solution, outsource it, because as you said, Ryan, you know, if you try and do everything at one time, you're not going to be good at anything. Mm -hmm. If you do get really really good at your business. And you layer on all these vendor partners that are are zeroed in exactly in that business. All these learnings, like I, we're sharing here right now, for example, on calling at ten fifty five. You know, you, you only learn that after doing ten thousand calls a day, right? So this is stuff where you just let the the best do the, the do the best, and then you do the rest. Yep. Okay. Um, let's see. I've got another question here from a great participation, guys. Thanks for being involved, Paul. Any advice for emerging Zoras at three years trying to get to the five percent standard? Yeah. Um, and it, it's probably just a repeat of some of the things that we already said, but what's your clear and compelling 
message. You know, I, I called it a vision earlier, but it can just be a message too, right? When people are thinking about your business model, you're up against a lot. Uh, you might be up against FSOs that are cre- crafting really good messaging. So how is it clear and compelling? What is your, ne- your unique selling benefit? Meaning how are you going to be better than the competition? Do you have a strong understanding of your numbers? So somebody can say, if I leave a job or if I hire a manager, I've got a great understanding of what this is going to look like financially for me. Do you have a strong understanding of how they can participate, whether it's full-time participation, semi-absentee? Do you have something that people can maybe not love in the beginning, but once they get into it, fall in love with it, like we talked about? So whatever your clear and compelling message is, make sure that you have it. And then again, momentum and patience. You know, a lot of people would probably say, hey, have a great training system, have a great support team. All of that is very true. You know, those are just table stakes to get in, but have a long-term mindset and manage the business on a regular basis, making sure that you're creating momentum towards those hundred. For some people, a hundred is going to happen in three years and other people, a hundred is going to happen in 30 years. And, you know, both is fine. It's just make sure that you provide an opportunity for people that they can, that they can make a living off of. And I would add to that, obsess about franchisee unit economics, yes. obsess about it. It should be, you should be up at night thinking about all the time, how do I add more value, increase margins for my franchisees? That stuff creates a flywheel effect where they start validating more and they start, if you know it's working, if your franchisees are referring you people that they know to buy the business, that's the day you know that you're, you're doing the right thing. If they're not, re, if you're not getting referrals from your franchisees, they're not in love with your brand. And so you need to make sure you're, you're obsessing about that. Um, Cliff has a question here. Do you use video messages? If so, how many? Uh, before you answer that, Ryan, I'll just add to this, Cliff. Using technology, like texting, I can't stress how, someone asked about emails earlier. Texting and open rates and answer rates are like, I don't know, 15 or 20 times higher than email at this point. Uh, you know, we, we do things at Pernexus, for example, for home services industries where we do something called text to schedule. So instead of having someone have to call in and talk to a human being or email and ask for an appointment, we'll text them with a link to a calendar to book their appointment for any of the home service brands we help and just you know leveraging those kinds of tools will increase your answer rates including a video and a text can be done as well but i'd love to hear what you're doing ryan with video as well yeah we do we do all those things you just said and yes video is very important so we don't really do the uh hey i'm going to create an email right now and video it and send it to you we'll do that through traditional email but we've got lots of pre-recorded videos that happen throughout the process for instance one of the most important is if somebody engages with sidekick and they're going to work with one of our advisors they'll immediately get an email an introduction email from that advisor just explaining who they are who am i going to work with right what's this person what's their background how long have they been doing it why are they qualified for me to work with right so that's one example of a video but we've got lots of pre-recorded videos, usually from the individual's advisor uh, to explain to them uh, what this process is going to look like. That That's so important. You know, I talked about the Sidekick 7. Just really mm-hmm. quick is leveraging a videos, technology, text message, whatever it is to make it very clear to your client or, or candidate, whatever you call them, on where they are in the process and what is next in the process, right? When somebody thinks about buying a franchise, if you were to say, hey, I want you to go through this 12-week process, I want you to spend the majority of your life savings and sign a 300-page contract that is going to predominantly be in the advantage of the franchisor, they're going to say, see you later, I'm happy with my job. But if you can say, all I need you to do is fill out a 30-minute survey so I can better understand what you're looking for. And from there, all I need you to do is I'm going to schedule three calls with three brands so you can have a 30-minute call with each one of them, right? We call them entrepreneurial milestones. When you break things down into small little milestones, it feels very achievable as opposed to looking at it at the the big picture. So I took that question completely in in a different direction, but it's the leveraging of those videos, technology and text messages. Yeah. And I, and I just to stress that we've seen video work very effectively in advertising it as well. You're seeing all the best brands are leveraging it on social and Instagram, LinkedIn. Uh, So you you should have a a video or multimedia strategy in general. Uh, In fact, we're launching another campaign that's coming here, I think, next week on our friend dev that's got leveraging a lot of video assets. And so uh, there's, you know, definitely make that investment in that category. And the cool thing is, is like you can just do a cell phone video of yourself talking and that can be as compelling as a $150,000 budget on a highly produced advertisement. So uh, another question we have here is on uh, to clarify, the question is, please discuss your experience with franchisee audits once a franchisee. Once a franchise gets past 100 units and it's, you know, about ensuring royalties are paid and we're accurate. I, first of all, I'm just going to say this. I hate the word audit. I tell my team this all the time. Please never tell a franchisee that they're being audited. That's like an IRS thing. I mean, if there's a surefire way to get people to look at their FDD to see what they what they agreed to or their franchise agreement is to tell them they're getting audited. Uh, I call it five-star business review. We've branded it that way. And it, and there's, a, there's an outcome from that review that's beneficial. 
We're gonna come in, look at your business, and show you how you can improve on your PL in certain areas, right? We're also looking to see if they've if they've not paid out all the rev or the royalties. So that does happen when there's some suspicions, but don't call it an audit. Brand it in some way that's positive and focus on driving value back to the franchisee in that process. Uh, in terms of the how how frequently we do that, I try to only do it when it's necessary, but we do have a requirement that they send in their, you know, their bank statements and their tax returns in a certain time frame. And if they're compliant, we have little goodies we give them. Uh, stuff like, you know, a free conference attendee fee or a, a, a match on their ad fund on some spends, you know, create some carrot as well as some, some stick. Uh, Ryan, what are your, what's your experience with that? Uh, you know, I, you're, you're much more qualified to answer that question than I am. So I don't have anything to add uh, around the, the, the audit or the, the review. The one thing I would say is we really encourage franchisors to collect royalties weekly. If you can, it just, it's, it's easier. It's more digestible for franchisees to pay mm -hmm. a, a weekly royalty as opposed to allowing it to balloon into a monthly royalty. So I'd encourage you to do that. Yeah, that's good advice there. This has been fantastic. I've got a lot of uh, notes. I got this, my book here is just full of all the stuff I've got. I'm calling them Ryanisms at Ooh, this point okay. and uh, they're, they're great. And I really appreciate uh, your time, Ryan. Hopefully everyone else has also found uh, some good notes to take as well. Thank you, Paul, for making note that it, uh, you've got four pages. That's great. Uh, and so thank you everyone for attending. Thank you, Ryan, for uh, giving us so much value. And we'll see you all next month, the same uh, Thursday at nine or 10 o'clock mountain. Good luck, everyone. Hey everyone, I hope you've enjoyed this video and more importantly, that it brings some value in your building your home services business. If you'd like to access more of this amazing content, like and subscribe below. If you'd like to be part of our live recordings and get involved with the speakers and myself, click the subscribe to calendar button or the link in the description to get updates to future events.